So they're within Honeywell, they're in the combustion business. The combustion business with Honeywell is broke up into two categories. One is the residential, and what is the commercial and industrial. I am responsible for the commercial and industrial business in the southeast. I'll give you all my cards before you leave. All of it or just the flames, bank flames? All of the commercial and industrial combustion. For the southeast, so I live there, you know, in the central Florida area, and I cover up through the Carolinas, and I go west over through Alabama, Mississippi, and uh, and, and south. So uh, my my role is I am the technical resource for that business, and I spend the majority of my time at end users, and end users can be either commercial or industrial. And so if we're talking about commercial end users, they can be where there's boilers installed, and they can be health care, they can be auditoriums, they can be churches, they can be synagogues, any, anything that has a boiler in, it, in a commercial building. The industrial world are the industrial manufacturing plants, and those could be people like pulp and paper, automotive, you know, food processing, food manufacturing, that sort of thing. The definition of a commercial combustion application versus an industrial application for the regulatory agencies involved in this business there. A commercial installation is defined as any facility with public access. So that means anybody in this room, we can walk down the street and we can walk into that building. Be it a church, a synagogue, an auditorium, an office building, we can walk in that building that's commercial. And there is a set of safety codes required for that operation of that equipment commercially. The equipment is buildings that don't have public access, where you just can't walk in the street and go in there and look at it, like where they're building Fords or Chevys or they're making potato chips or something like that. And they have their own rules and guidelines. So with that, these are the kind of businesses that, that we deal with. These are all commercial and industrial. What does a flame safeguard do? What's the purpose of a flame safeguard system? Flame safeguard system is the purpose is to provide safe operation of equipment, to prevent bodily injury, to prevent property loss, or in extreme cases, prevent death. And this is a boiler, a picture of a boiler in uh, uh, New Mexico. And when you have a problem with a boiler, you have a disruption like this. We don't call them explosions. We call them poofs. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, they poofed one at such, such a place in Lakeland, Florida. They poofed one uh, late last year, blew it right out of the building and landed on the railroad tracks about 300 feet away. That's a pretty significant puff. That's a pretty significant puff. <laughs> yeah. And we know what the cause was. And you know you can go into forensics investigations and find out what causes those. So these systems are designed to keep those at a minimum. This is a bigger puff. This was in Tennessee in, excuse me, in 2007. I was going to use my, to my 1960s technology here. This is a manufacturing facility. This is the boiler. This is where the boiler finally came to rest after a major incident with the boiler. This is a steel corrugated garage door that was closed at the time between the boiler room and the manufacturing. So when the boiler, when this incident occurred at the boiler, the boiler vessel itself went through the door. The door wrapped itself around the boiler, traveled approximately 100 feet into the manufacturing facility, and the equipment in the manufacturing facility actually stopped its, its progress. This is a view uh, of the boiler. 
here is the gas so you can see the size of the fuel valve that's one of the fuel safety shutoff valves that's about a probably about a three inch valve so that thing was delivering a bunch of gas in the combustion chamber when the incident occurred there is a door back at this it's missing and we'll, let you, we'll show you here where that went. This is a close-up view of the back of the boiler. The burner is on this side over here. This steel that you see here, here, and here is called a tube sheet. It's called a tube sheet because all these tubes here are welded to that sheet. And those tubes go from the front of the board to the back of the boiler. Then they get near the back and they turn and they come out the other way. In this case, these tubes all have heated air. This is the, they call the, um, the combustion chamber. It's also called the Venturi, the Morrison tube. So the burner heats up all the air, and there's a blower behind it that pushes all that heated air it pushes it through here from that far end, and then it makes a turn. The heated air, and air makes a turn down these tubes. So it turns, goes back towards the front, gets to the back side, and then comes out here on these tubes and out the stack. This whole, all these tubes are surrounded by water. And this, this was a boiler that produced steam, so it took the water and made it into steam, and then it took the steam to drive the, uh, the operation, the manufacturing facility, so it's a steam boiler. <clears throat> the inside of this Morrison tube, these are the tubes, you can see the tube. This steel covered those tubes, and the violence of the incident caused that steel to buckle and curl. It, yeah, and that, that steel is probably a quarter inch. So there's a lot of energy to cause that thing to do that. The door that was attached, that's one of the hinges, and you can see how big that is. There's another one down there that's hidden from view. That door weighed 7,500 pounds. So about the size of a really big car or two average sedans. And it left, it was blown off of the boiler. This is where the garage door sat. This is the stack from that boiler. And there's the boiler back there. No, what happens is the heated air, that stack, that's after the heated air flows through the boiler, it just goes outside. And what happens is as that heated air goes through those tubes, the water around it gets heated up and creates steam. And creates steam. Yep. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of the boiler itself. Another boiler just like it, sitting next to it. The boiler sitting here. There's it's kind of hard to see, but this right here, I have a close-up view. That's a crosswalk. There's a little ravine there, and the employee parking lot is back here. You can see the cars. And they would park their cars, and they would come across that employee crosswalk into the plant to work. And this, the door, when it blew off the border, blew through this wall and created that hole. So that 7,500 pound steel door created that hole is about approximately 30 by 30. And here's an exterior view. There's the other boiler. The one we're talking about sat here. That's an expansion tank. And this is concrete block and this is just aluminum cladding, but you can see the concussion of that, what it did to that I-beam, the force and it blew a 7,500 pound 
door to here. As approximately 100 yards. It left the vessel. It hit two vehicles that were parked against the building. Of course, it knocked the concrete block wall down. It hit a tree. It hit part of the pedestrian crosswalk, continued its flight, and it hit the top edge of this embankment and slid down into the bottom of that little gully, that little ravine, where it, where it finally came to rest. And this is uh, this, that's part of the tree that it hit here. And you can see what it did to the crosswalk. It ended up over in this area here, but you can see what happened to the, the crosswalk. And this is just a block wall in the boiler room. Nothing made any contact with it. The energy just caused the wall to collapse. And nothing made contact with this tank. The energy caused those indentations in that steel tank. There was a person within 25 feet of that boiler, in that boiler room when this, when this occurred. And we'll talk about how that happened. <clears throat> it happened about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. This is in Tennessee in 2007. Did that person die? No. But I don't think he'll ever go in the ballroom again the rest of his life. I think they sent him home for the rest of the day, and he had probably had to change his clothes. <laughs> 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 First you say it, then you do. Yeah, well, what happened is um, this is a steam boiler, <clears throat> and um, the boiler, the issue of the boiler was the boiler was flooding and what that means is the boiler was getting too much water and because it had so much water it couldn't effectively and efficiently convert that water into steam that's kind of like getting water to boil in a pot the more that's in there the more energy it takes to make that pot boil you know five inches of water versus two inches of water well in this case there wasn't enough energy in that boiler to convert all that water to steam. So it was called flooding, which is, it doesn't work very well, it's inefficient. And in order to guard against that, there's a system on a boiler called feed water. It feeds water into the boiler. And there's a level control that looks at this big tank full of water and it's being heated up. And it looks at what the level of water is. It knows where it has to be and able to convert it into steam. And this, this controller, sends a signal out to this valve that says I need more water or I need less water. So it's a Honeywell mod motor on a linkage on a valve. Now there's another device on there <coughs> called low water cutoff. That's a safety device. If for some reason you, get, you don't get enough water in it, it gets to a minimum that creates an unsafe condition, then it will turn the system off. And it looks like a float. It's a float type mechanism like you find on the back of your toilet. Okay? Well, the McDonald Miller is one major one, yeah. Well, what was happening with this was the boiler was flooding. It was getting too much water. So the operators at this industrial decided, well, we need to go fix the problem. So the solution to fix the problem was to go to the feed water valve that had the Honeywell motor on it and we will disconnect the linkage from the valve from the motor and we will just partially open or partially close that valve and that will fix the problem and now we're just allowing as much as we could possibly get in there. What happened? What happened was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the assistant plant manager was walking by the room, if you read the forensics investigation. He said, I heard a strange noise coming out of the boiler room. So I walked in the boiler room, and a description to him was, I noticed boiler number one was cherry red. Well, what had happened is they restricted the water and the boiler ran out of water. So now all that heat energy that's going to be absorbed by that cold water in those tubes, now it's being absorbed by the steel. All those tubes and sheets we saw. 
and it got so heated, it turned the steel cherry red. It's like taking a cast iron skillet and put it on the burner. Mm -hmm. So the guy says it was cherry red. He knew what the problem was. So he walked over to an area in the boiler room. He bypassed the system and he pumped 72 degree groundwater into the boiler. Well, the effect is if you had a cast iron skillet that was cherry red, you take an eyedropper, drop a drop of water on it, what does it do? He goes, Psst. it flashes the steam and the volume is 10,000 to one. So that one drop of water becomes a ratio of 10,000 in volume of steam. So that 72 degree groundwater hit that cherry red steel and that was the result. It's kind of like Elvis left the building. This was the boiler left the room and which begs the question, well, what happened to all our safeties? I'll, 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 I'll show you some data here in a minute about why, to answer your question, why would you do something like that? Anyhow, um, remember we said just a minute ago that they have low water cutoffs? So there's a device in there that if the water got too low, it wouldn't allow it to fire that way. It would turn off that float. So the forensics teams looked at it. The, the law says you have to have two of them. The first one will be a float type, like your McDonald Miller. And then the second one can be another float type on the other side of the boiler, or it can be one that has a probe, like a conductivity probe. And it's sticking from the top shell. And as the water comes up, it makes contact, and it will measure that there's water. It's basically a, a backup to the float. <clears throat> so they opened up to McDonald Miller, and one of the electrical contact fingers was severed. That was existing prior to the incident. You can know forensically that this was not the result of the incident because the rust on these surfaces is already there. If it would have been a clean break, you wouldn't have seen the rust there. Not only that, but they found that the float mechanism itself it was rusted here and was not working. So low water, cover, co low water cutoff number one was broken in inoperative. Well, what about the second one, which was the probe type coming in the top of the, the boiler? Well, there is a, on the side of the boiler, there's a little electrical box, and inside there's a relay with a manual reset button. So if it trips on, you go and you push the button, so it'll start again. This is what's supposed to be in the electrical cabinet. You got a manual reset button here, and you got a couple of sets of contacts, both of which are normally open. Okay? It trips. This is what was installed. No reset button. And instead of normally closed contacts, low water cutoff number two was inoperative. It was wrong. All done by the owner. So the result was that some people got hurt. The guy got hurt, but he didn't have to go to the hospital or anything, but he, he was a little cherry red himself. Now, what's interesting, too, is that this, these boilers have to be inspected by insurance companies because they're carrying a liability on these things. Okay, And an insurance inspector had looked at this boiler two and a half weeks prior to this incident and checked off that it was in good operating condition and obviously was not because these two safeties that would have prevented this from happening were inoperative and should have been detected at the time of the inspection. <clears throat> this is a report from the National Board. You can go to their website, it's nationalboard.org and this is the National Agency of Boiler and Pressure Vessel Inspectors from around, all around the country. Every state has boiler inspectors for your commercial boilers. Uh, in the state of Florida, there's about four of them. In the state of Georgia, there's about 35, 37 of them. Um, the reason for that is there aren't a lot of boilers in Florida relative to the number of boilers in Georgia. 
There's about a, pr a pressure vessel, some that are, have burners on them and some that are just pressurized vessels. Um, Florida has about 15,000 registered. Georgia's got about 65,000 registered. So there's a difference. Plus the boiler inspectors in Georgia, they work for the De Georgia Department of Labor. They also are your elevator inspectors. So half the day they're investigating make sure the elevators are operating properly, and the other half of their day they're spent to make sure the boilers are operating properly. <clears throat> and uh, those that don't, the industrial guys, they're, they're more concerned, these inspectors, the state guys, are more, in, more concerned with the commercial boilers. These industrial guys, they are inspected by their insurance companies. But when there's an incident, they have to be reported. So here's the second quarter of 2012. I need to update this and go back and look at it. There were 48 reports of violations. Well, 140,000 inspections, they found 15,000 violations, or about 11% of the boilers out there were not operating safely nationally. If you go back, 10 to 12, 11% is pretty much the standard. So 10% of them aren't safe. Those violations, 31% <clears throat> of them were the controls on a board, which is the business the Honeywell's in. The next highest category at 28% was the piping. Something's piped wrong. And then it goes down below 20% after that. So it behooves us to make sure that we do our, our things right. On the wrong piping, would that be initial install? <coughs> Not a boiler that's been mm -hmm. in service for 10 years, and now someone finally comes in, oh, it's piped right. Well, it's always, you know, someone should have caught the, the piping can involve <coughs> probably not that. On a new installation, it's probably get code. But over years, the piping could involve they've got the wrong valves on them. They've got the, uh, their, their, the, the pipe train, the fuel trains aren't to code. The codes have changed. Water and gas have changed. Um, they also have to look at pressure relief valves. And so there's a lot of things that, that can be involved in the piping. And it doesn't have to be on the stick on the, on the, uh, on the control side. Mm -hmm. Would that be considered a violation yeah. or is that mm -hmm. overlooked? No, there are code books. I mean, we'll talk about some of those codes. And the codes tell us what we can and cannot do on that, on that boiler. Or how, which, what stuff you have to have on it to make it operate safely. <clears throat> so the definition of a flame safeguard system is a set of controls used in a system provide safe operation as required by the application and that second section on there that says, as required by the application, that's where the codes come in. So it says, if you have this boiler in this application, you have to comply with this code. If you have it in this kind of an application, you have to comply with this code. You don't need to get yourself too concerned about codes. Those are determined by others. Um, most of them are in compliance. Uh, when I get involved with people, they'll say, well, I need this controls upgraded. Um, what do I need to put on there? Well, I don't know, because I don't know what code you have to meet. So you got to tell me what code you need to meet, and then I can help you decide what you need to put on there to meet that standard. Now, the little hook in this is there is a national standard. And so the codes and standards people have said, for this kind of a vessel, this is, what sh this is the requirements on that pressure vessel. But a local jurisdiction, it can be a city, it can be a state, it can be a county, municipality, what they have the authority to do is take a look at that standard, and this is the national standard. We've met all this, but we've made a few changes that we like we're not 
the changes we're making are enhancing the standards and making them a little more stringent, a little tighter. So the owner needs to know what the local code is. There's this national code, but you need to know what the local code is. A baseline that the vast majority of people adhere to. Uh, a company, an end user, like a Ford, they can take the national standard from their insurance company, but if they have an incident at one of their plants, their insurance carrier may say, or they, if they're self-insured, their liability people could say, well, you know, we're going to increase our level of safety. So this is where we are today. The next safest level is up here. So we meet the law, we meet the code, but we're going to take it to the next step and make it even safer than what is really required. Ford did that many, many years ago. They had an incident in one of their plants, and then they went through there and they said, we're going to go what they call max safety. And Stromquist is involved in that when Ford was here in Atlanta. And Sam Lindley was, and I were involved in that. And they took everything way beyond what they really needed because their safety people says that's where we're going. We got to make sure that doesn't happen again. So, happen again? not at Ford, no. Mm. Uh, flame safeguard systems, these are where you'll find them. You'll find them in steam and hot water boilers. You'll find them in afterburners, and afterburners are just their, their little uh, burners that stuff has come out, and it could be um, uh, some gas or something off a of process, and they, they do a final burn to, to clear it up, clean it up. Incinerators uh, can also be referred to as cremators. Ovens, kilns, dryers, makeup air heaters, and this category down here called special effects or pyrotechnics. All of these categories up here, the function of that flame safeguard system is to make sure that that stuff doesn't create an explosion. These guys down here think just the opposite. They want controls on there that help create an explosion, but create it safely. And so all of these have a code. There is a code for pyrotechnics, and this is for theme parks and movie shows and rides and that sort of thing. And um, the law says that anytime, if you're in the entertainment business, and anytime there is smoke, spark, or fire, you have to have a flame safeguard system monitoring that. And uh, because of where I live down there in Central Florida, we get involved routinely in the rides and shows stuff down there. Um, and even in the entertainment. We did the last two, we did the park tactics for the Rolling Stones the last two world tours and got in trouble at Tampa Stadium. We had designed two columns, two tubes of fire, and we could throw a wall, a column of fire 80 feet in the air. And we had these burners set in the corners by the end zones for their concert at Tampa Stadium. And they were testing. And there's a lot of energy to do that. <laughs> you know, firing that tube or fire up there. And a lot of that's propane. Get the, if you see a movie, get out of that big, billowy, yellowish, bright stuff. That's liquid propane. Unless you turn the tanks upside down. They light it with gas propane. But it's liquid propane. Put butane and methane in it, too, to different effects. But anyhow, um, but in order to protect the turf, they put rubber pads on the ground and then put the burners on top of them and they fired them. Well, the rubber absorbed all of the heat from these basic jet engines and it boiled the grass below it. And so when they pulled those rubber pads up, they had these big black squares in the end zones. <laughs> And boy, did they, did they get all excited about that. We said, you know, leave it alone, the, the energy would have gone someplace else other than this big sponge of rubber sucking it in there. They had to go and you know, replace some of the turf. And the guy that designed this was outside of Lakeland. He was in Plant City, Florida. Uh, and, um, and he even got a call, a visit from the NFL. 
pointed finger. Yeah, he pointed finger and said, hey, mm -mm, wasn't my deal, wasn't my deal. And uh, he also designed the, for the Stones tour where the cobra snake spit the ball of fire and it arched from one mouth to the other through the sky. That's uh, just a ball of liquid propane gas and they used a, a joystick from a video game and built it and poof, and under just air pressure, punk. So anyway, uh, that's kind of an interesting, uh, if you guys ever get down to Florida, get with those guys down there and we may be able to get you in the rides and show stuff and it's uh, it's interesting, uh, in interesting world. Especially if you get some of that back lot stuff and see how they do that stuff. It's, the technology is phenomenal. Like um, earthquake, you know, if you've been in an earthquake, what a water comes down, you know, that's 30,000 gallons of water for every show comes down and it goes underneath that platform behind you. And there are four 125 horsepower pumps that pump that water out of there, clean it, filter it, and get it staged. And they can clean 30,000 gallons of water in 90 seconds. And get it ready for the next one. And that that cable car that comes down the tunnel, it twists. If you get the inside of the thing, there's a torsion bar, a steel rod going through the thing about 12, 13 inches in diameter. And there's a motor that takes that torsion bar and twists that steel rod that's attached to that subway car and causes that subway car to twist with a big torsion bar. And when you're in that tunnel working those panels, you run those panels and that thing goes by you by about 12 inches. No inspections on the rides. There is no agency that inspects the rides at any theme park in California, Florida, or Ohio. They're responsible for doing that themselves. And when that park closes, those rides and shows people are on that ride until it opens the next day, they work through the night. My first sales call was at 3 a.m. in the morning for Jaws. They needed a flame detector you could use underwater. We created one for them. And uh, so they could put it out there where the shark blows up. Yeah, you want to see me? It's 3 o'clock in the morning. Anyhow, we talked about the codes. And these are the codes and standards that the system is involved in. You're familiar with Underwriters Laboratories, UL. ASME CSD1, that is the code for commercial buildings. You don't need to remember all this stuff, just kind of make you aware of it. FMG and NFPA, those are the codes for the industrial guys. These three codes here are an adaptation of this code. Kemper, Hart, Zurich, those are insurance companies that do inspections. CSA is Canadian standards. They have their own AGA, American Gas Association. ANSI is American National Standards. CE is Europe. Europe, by country, has their own codes and standards. And so when Sam Lindley is designing the system, he needs to know what code they need to make. And then he designs around that code. Rebuilt. Some people take these safety controls the safety relay, which function in life, is to make sure that that system operates safely and they repair or rebuild them. The commercial code strictly prohibits that from being done. No manufacturer that makes these burner safety relays makes parts available in the aftermarket. So the only source they have for those replacement or repair parts are other used controls. And they're prob so we know, number one, it's a used control that the guy's buying. And we, and we also know that it probably is not current design because manufacturers, they change their design all the time. And so the code then says, well, we're not going to allow you to use that rebuilt or repaired control in that border in that church. So the law says that once a control is repaired or altered, you, being the owner of that property, and the rebuilder, the people that rebuilt the control, have total responsibility. 
So if a contractor goes into that church and they need a new safety control, then he sells them a rebuilt safety control. And there's an incident as a result. And it's proven the, re the cause of that incident as that rebuilt control. The owner, the guy that installed it, are fully responsible. The insurance company has no liability. The law also says that if you have one of those things, it must be clearly labeled, rebuilt by, and the manufacturer's, the original manufacturer's name and markings need to be removed from the control. So if it was a Honeywell control, it can no longer say Honeywell on it. It can look like it, and you can say, well, that's a Honeywell, but it cannot have the name on it. So if you take a look at The current design Honeywell Burner Safety Relay, there's a label here. This is an older one. The newer ones, if you were to look at them, the name Honeywell is stamped, embossed right here in the plastic. And so if they ever had to remove the Honeywell name, they would have to grind the letters off. And if they do that, then they would grind and put a big hole right in the front of the control. We did that to save them from rebuilding it. If you look at the printed circuit boards in here, there's four levels of printed circuit boards and they're held in place with screws on little stuff. Those screws are put in a certain way and they're designed that if you try to back those screws out, they will shut the printed circuit board. And the printed circuit board has a part number on it and it's stamped on the phenolic board. And then all the little components like resistors and diodes and capacitors Placed in the solder in. Uh, now, do they meet the requirements uh, as far as the name? If they simply just go ahead and put a label over it, or maybe they have to physic adhesive, adhesive uh, um, like a metal plate. No, it has the the original manufacturing name must be physically removed. It has to be removed, not covered up. Can't cover it. Has to be removed, okay. and then they also have to have fixed a sticker like you're talking about on the device someplace that says rebuilt by with their name. Gotcha. And so if you open that electrical cabinet, you could be looking at a box like a blue box like that. It wouldn't have the manufacturer's name on it, but there would be a sticker on it that says rebuilt by. Now who carries that insurance? Now, um, as far as you're saying um, it would be the owner and mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the guy that installed it. That installs it. Now does mm -hmm. his insurance um, that now? They, well, like they're, that? they're liable, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. What is your insurance going to pay? Yes. Okay. And you can imagine what we're talking about if somebody were to get injured. If you have personal injury, and the re there, it says, well, why would people do that? Why would they take the risk? Because they're inexpensive. So, you know, they're looking to, to save a buck. So I'll go buy that rebuilt thing on, on the internet and I'll plug it in there. Most of the violations, what you'll find, are done by the building owners themselves. And they'll go and they'll say, well, I'm going to repair this thing. I'm going to maintain it. I'm going to fix it. And of all of the categories nationally, the biggest offenders are commercial laundries. The corner laundry but it has a little boiler in the back for hot water or steam. They are the most frugal, <laughs> seems to be, and they're always looking for a place to take a shortcut. And uh, if, I, I, if I walk into a facility and I see a rebuilt control, I walk out. I have a brief discussion about what I shouldn't do, and I said, I said, I'm not touching this thing because I'm not going to be held liable. If I touch it, I'm liable too. You had a question, yes, sir. Uh, next YZ boiler manufacturer. Mm -hmm. I have a 7800, and you, I, I, I pay you to modify the mounting so that I now have an OEM that you're a part. And the only difference is just the little tap. Mm -hmm. All right, you get. Yeah, uh, I know where you're going. And and you modify the yeah. tab. It, what does that do to liability? Nothing. 
what he's talking about is Honeywell manufacturing. Honeywell, there's a lot of there's other people in this business. You you sell Honeywell, you sell FireEye, and some others. Um, but there's two different versions of these. We have some part numbers that are sold to distributors like Stromquist. We have the same device with a different part number to sold to a, a manufacturer, a boiler manufacturer, a burner manufacturer. And years ago, Honeywell used to make proprietary. You know, there's a, that manufacturer would come to Honeywell and say, we want this control and we want it made this way. And we would make it special for them. And then you're another manufacturer, I want my special one too. And then this guy says, I want my special one. That's because for the replacement market, then the owner would have to come back to you to buy that replacement control and you would jack the price way up. Okay. So it locked them into all of the future replacement business. Well, many years ago, Honeywell went to all those manufacturers, we're not going to make you any more special stuff. We're not going to do it. So the thing that looks like this that Stromquist buys is identical in functionality to the one that the manufacturer buys. In some cases, they have a mechanical interlock. And that means that these little tabs right here, see these tabs? They form the plastic different. And so this will not plug into the wiring sub-base because there's a physical and barrier. And what you have to do is you have to snap that tab off and then it'll fit. And then you've got the same control. So his question is, if I go and I break that tab off, does I buy it to code? No. The code is dealing with the function of the device, not to how it sits in a sub-base. So it has no, that has, that has nothing to do with the violating the code. So any OEM 7800 out there right now, literally, you snap the tab and you can put in one of Stromquist's 7800 in, and it will function. Uh, not any. It's just one particular manufacturer we do okay. that for, okay? okay. Um, and uh, it's, it's primarily Cleaver Brooks, okay? okay? Cleaver Brooks is the largest uh, boiler manufacturer in the world. And, and when, we, when you go to a customer like that that spends gobs and gobs and gobs of money with you every year and say, hey, look, we're not going to sell you what you want. You're going to buy what we tell you you're going to get. There's a risk assessment you have to go through, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and so we said, we're not going to make one that functionally does something a little bit different, but still stays within the code, we'll do something that is a mechanical difference. So the one that Stromquist sells without changing that tab won't fit. And then it doesn't say Honeywell up here, it says Cleaver Brooks. Okay. But down here, it says Honeywell. It says clear Brooks on this, because this is just a sticky label. Those are easy to change. But uh, it's one in particular. The rest of the manufacturers, they say, I'll take that standard. I don't want to be bothered with it. I'll take that standard. It might be a different part number, but it's functionally exactly the same control. And so what you'll get sometimes is with a Cleaver Brooks number, you might get the customer say, Clearer Brooks part numbers on the back of the control right here. It'll have the Honeywell part number, and then below it, the Clearer Brooks will have their part number. 833-506. Well, I need an 833-506. Well, look at the other number on there. It'd be an RM something or other. And then if you look, and I'll show you in a cross-reference, if you look that RM, the Honeywell RM number up, they'll say proprietary to Cleaver Brooks. But there's a description of it. And there's a bunch of columns with drop down information of what it does. Well, if you look above or below that line, they'll have the exact same description, and it'll be the one that you guys have on your shelf. And so the Cleaver Brooks guys, they can only get the Cleaver Brooks model from Cleaver Brooks. You guys have to give them the trade equivalent. 
And we have all the inf you already have that information here. But in those cases that he's talking about, there's a mechanical interlock you have to deal with. Just be aware of rebuilt. Now, what does the flame safeguard system do? Starts and stops the burner. So I got to turn it off, I got to turn it on. And that can be either done uh, automatically with a temperature control or a pressure control for hot water or steam or temperature control for a furnace, or it can be done manually. And a manual system, the most sophisticated manual system, is a button that says start. So you push the button to start, you push the button to stop it. That's a manual system. There are other manual systems out there that exist with handheld torches. Guy goes through, opens the hatch, he sticks the little torch in there, lights the burner, goes to the next one, lights the burner, goes to the next one, lights the burner. Uh, and you might have, you know, 47 of them lined up on one side. Uh, or the, uh, to take a rag and they soak in a little kerosene and they open up the fuel valve and let the gas go in the combustion chamber. They light that rag with their cigarette lighter, open a door, throw it in and jump out of the way. Yep, mm -hmm. that's a manual, that's a manual lit system. And there are systems like that in existence today that are lit that way every day. It also starts the burner in the proper sequence, and then it supervises it during, during operation, monitors the flame, makes sure it's burning. It guards the system against excessive temperatures and pressures with limit and safety devices. If mod <coughs> excuse me, if you have a modulating burner versus one that's just on and off, then there is a modulating valve on there and it's called firing rate. It increases or decreases the rate at which the burner is firing how big the flame is, and then it maintains it during the off cycle. So these are the types of controls you're going to find in a flame safeguard application. The controller turns it on, turns it off. Temperature controller, pressure controller, that's all it does. On, off, on, off, on, off. If it's modulating, then you have the firing rate controller, which is your modulating thermostat or modulating pressure switch. Your limits and safety controls, those are like gas pressure switches to make sure the gas pressure is the right. The gas pressure doesn't get too high or doesn't get too low. You have limit controls. We don't want the temperature or pressure to get too high. If it does, it turns it off. It's unsafe. <clears throat> you have interlocks, and an interlock is the system makes sure that everything is in the proper position to start. It's like a permissive. You have my permission to start or continue, and it's an interlock. In other words, unless I can prove that something just happened, I'm not going to allow you to operate this equipment anymore. It might be like an airflow switch. I need my blower on, and an interlock is my switch, my control in there that proves that my airflow is on. It's called an airflow switch. So that's an interlock. If that airflow switch doesn't make when it's supposed to, it says, well, your blower's not running, you know, shut down. You got fuel valves and you got your safety control, which is the blue box. So, simple sequence of operation. Controller says, I need more hot water. All your limits are electrically in series, wired in series. Goes to the safety control. It starts the burner. The burner produces flame. The flame detection system is monitoring the flame and telling the flame safeguard control it's all good. At the same time, all these limits and interlocks are monitoring what's going on with that burner to make sure it's still good. So that's the control loop. There are, I'm just going to go through some pictures here so you recognize what you're looking at. Let me go through this quick. Uh, operating controllers. Um, these can be your on-off controllers. They can be your high limit controllers, L L404. They don't look like this anymore. Switch. So we've gone to the do new style. So that controller we talked about on off, that's what it would look like. High limits. The temperature gets too high, then you have a high limit control. And these high limit controls have a push button on the front so you can go and you can reset it if it trips out. That's gas pressure switches. Most of the time you're gonna see these little C6097, the little gas pressure switch is about this big. They monitor the gas pressure going to the burner. 
Again, they make sure the gas pressure isn't too low and they make sure the gas pressure isn't too high. You have to operate within a range to make sure it operates properly. And then you got fuel valves. <clears throat> you got safety shutoffs here. This is a fire aid. This is a mo uh, modulating fuel valve. And then you might have some solenoid type. And they perform different functions. So this is an on-off burner. So this is if you had to come up with the piping diagram for all your fuel valves. We're going to go through this one and take a break. Here's my gas supply coming in. Here's my blower, uh, boiler over here. Pilot gas line. I got an manual valve, a pressure regulating valve, and I got a safety shutoff valve on my pilot line. I need to update this. Those now require in your industrial process rolls a second safety shutoff valve. But not for commercial. And commercially, yes, if the local jurisdiction says so. City of Chicago says we want two valves on there. And that when they change the rules, then you have to go back and add them. Okay? Your main gas line, you got a manual shutoff valve, the hand valve. Pressure regulator. This is your low gas pressure switch. This is your high gas pressure switch to make sure they're not too low or too high. You got two big safety shutoff valves. These are those two big safety shutoff valves. That pilot valves, they look like something like this. Okay. So the reason why they want a second one on the pilot line is because if the one fails open, Putting a small amount of gas in the fire structure, which it's redundant. It's just it's just redundancy in the system. If one if one of them craps on it, you got a you got a second one to back it up and make sure to cut the fuel supply off. In the you know in this scenario here, if something were to happen with this one and it didn't close, you, you know, there's nothing to stop the gas from going into the burner. So they put two of them. Same reason there's two on here. Redundancy. This also, be, between these two safety shutoff valves, is another solenoid valve. And what the vent valve does is when the burner is running, that valve is closed, so all the gas goes into the combustion chamber in here. When these valves are closed, that vent valve opens. And the reason it does that, if any gas leaks through this valve, it goes down here to the outside, it's vented. So it doesn't accumulate in here. And if you get a big accumulation of gas between these two valves, because this one's leaking, you start that burner, you're gonna get a bit of slug of gas and you'll get a rough light off. Or you could have an audible light off. But you would not have that, if you have a double shut off valve in the pilot line, you wouldn't have a vent, lead, would you? a vent line. Some do, some don't. In fact, these pressures, a lot of an industrial world, they had vents behind those, and so any gas that accumulates in that, that pressure switch, they weren't vented to. They're vented separately from this vent. And the reason being, this is higher pressures, and they don't want us backing up into those. So they vent them separately. And this is the same thing if it was a modulating valve. You have a firing rate, the modulating valve will go down there and adjust the firing rate. So I was just showing you what the gas train would look like. Here's your two safety shutoff valves, here's your gas pressure switches, and here's your vent valve. Now what you don't see here on top of these are the big motors that operate them. Those big safety shutoff motors, they have springs in them because the code says that if you have a problem on that burner, that, safe, that, that, that main fuel line must close in less than one second. And so when those operators are, are manufactured at the factory, there's a spring steel that's about this big around. It's rolled in the manufacturing process. So that roll, that coil is about that big around. And it's about, oh, half inch wide and maybe 16 inch steel. 
And when that operator comes in for that spring to be mounted into that valve, there's a shroud that drops down over it because they take that coil that's that big and they wind it to something about that big. And then it's inserted on the shaft and then it's pinned in place. The valves are um, uh, hydraulic. There's, there's a hydraulic system inside those valves that open and close the valves. And so when you get the hydraulic, it's a, it's a mil-spec oil in there. Um, that when that valve is operating, it's pressurized, the hydraulics are keeping the valve open against that spring. So when that valve opens, that spring gets wound a little bit tighter. And so if there's a problem, there's a dump. That hydraulic fluid gets dumped out of that chamber into another one, and that spring takes over, and it goes bam. It's closed in less than one second. And when they close, you know they close. They're and they're closed. I've been on a platform with 10 inch gas valves. When they close, they move the earth. That's a big gas line. There's a lot of gas coming in there. And uh, you'll know when they're closed. You'll hear them. Let's take a break. I've got uh, about. <laughs>